So the event today that we've had at the Welcome I guess started about six months ago now when it was a couple of musicians, Oscar and Gareth, came to us and they, they ran to us with this new publication They said, can you interpret this new piece of information that's come out? They've stuck some jazz musicians into the brain scanner. What on earth does it mean? So we started reading around the science of improvisation, the science of jazz, the science of creativity. And there's one thing that started to come out of it. There was this picture that somehow people that are really good at improvising deactivate or sort of turn off parts of their brain. So then we worked with Marina, the jazz musicians, the other cognitive neuroscientists to sort of create this day where we investigated one on stage improvisation, the jazz musicians working, and which parts of their brain they either activated or deactivated to get most out of their performance. And you know, the truth is there was a lot of improvisation that was going on. And I, you know, to see someone doing really great improvisation in front of you and while I'm looking at them, I'm thinking, what on earth is going on inside their mind to enable them to do that? Well, I think we all got a little piece of that today. Okay, so most of the interesting bits of the brain seem to be focused towards the front part of the brain, um, which is where a lot of the, the more complicated, higher order cognitive functions seem to reside. So this consciousness and self-awareness they all seem to be focused towards the front of the brain. But what was really interesting, especially in the study of the jazz musicians, is that although some of those areas were lighting up, I don't want to bore you with too many anatomical details, but the ventral area, which seems to be involved in this kind of drive to create something, has also been linked to people telling their own story, an autobiographical story. This was really firing on. But what was really striking was the fact that a lot of the rest of the brain was actually getting deactivated. So the same areas that would be active if you were trying to solve a problem, if you were doing a, a Sudoku or um, trying to solve the structure of DNA, those areas would have been really active and turned on. But during improvisation, they're actually, they're actually turned off. And it's the idea that, that those parts of the brain that really try and puzzle out problems can actually inhibit some of this, this creativity. So you have to turn them off to, to let the creativity out. And interestingly enough, if you were to image someone's brain whilst they were dreaming, you would also have a very similar deactivation. And of course we, we associate a dream with these new ideas, these unexpected ideas linking together in novel ways, which might be a bit like the creative state. We've carried out a large amount of research at the university which shows that when people improvise for about 20 minutes it has a very positive impact on their ability to problem solve or to process information such that after they've improvised they actually get um, better and faster at um, processing certain types of verbal information. In terms of where this research might go with improvisation we're currently asking several questions and those questions are about the domain specificity of the enhancements you get after improvising. So what I mean by that is, if you improvise verbally using words, we know that this has a positive impact on your ability to process words, to use language 20 minutes later or an hour later. We've also found out, interestingly, that when you improvise using words, it has a positive impact on your ability to process colour information. What we're really interested in to see is can we improvise in something like dance and when you're using dance improvisation which has no verbal content at all will that still have a positive impact on your verbal processing domain or will it as we suspect it might do have a large effect on your ability to navigate a spatial environment so in other words how you move around a particular space so your spatial awareness might be enhanced by dance improvisation and the interesting question is, will your verbal abilities be improved as well? The idea was that um, by studying the behaviour of swarms, bees buzzing around in a swarm, we get some kind of insight about what it means to improvise, for example, in a musical situation. What we do is we try and build up a mathematical model of how bees move and turn that into an animation. So, um, in fact, what computer scientists have found 
there's just a very few simple rules are enough to generate very convincing animations of actual swarms, which leads you to believe that that's how it kind of really happens in nature. First of all, the, each swarming individual is only aware of neighbours in its immediate vicinity. So, for example, with, with herring in the sea, there might be a gigantic shoal of herring, but each herring, as it were, can only see a few neighbouring fish. And so the first rule is, with, if you, you look at your neighbours, and if you're drifting away from people, from other individuals, swim back in towards um, your neighbours. So that kind of coheres the swarm as a whole. Second rule is just avoid collisions. I mean, in nature, yeah. herring don't actually swim into each other. So, yeah. if you're getting too close, then kind of swim away. It's slightly random disturbances in the flight that are communicated neighbour to neighbour that generate the twists and the turns. So, it's entirely without central planning. Or, I mean, this is what we believe. This is what biologists believe. When I first saw th these animations of swarms, it just struck me that uh, this is music. You know, music is about structuring in time through sound and through seeing the animations I was seeing a structuring in space so I thought well if that space was, was mapped on to a space of musical parameters then the movement of the swarm would correspond to movements within music. I asked each member of the audience to, to pretend they were in a musical swarm and they each had an instrument and they had to make sounds on the instrument and they were listening just to their neighbour and engaging with their neighbour only but they were standing in a big circle. So that was, the, that was the analogy with the swarming. But because they were responding just to their neighbour, if someone started playing loud, loudly, then that could migrate all around the circle and we get a kind of group cohesive behaviour. And uh, yeah, remarkably it worked. It was a little bit experimental, but we did a five minute piece of music with each uh, workshop. And uh, what amazed me most of all is that they all knew when to stop. Yeah. We hadn't, we hadn't planned it, yeah. We hadn't planned it how to stop at all. I didn't give them any clues, but somehow it was communicated musically throughout the swarm, and, and, and they just came to an end. Well, a few months ago, um, I met um, Alan Watson from Cardiff and Adrian, uh, Adrian Brendel, the cellist. And we were looking to see if we could find anything useful using physiological traces about performance anxiety, about uh, tension in performance, and also looking at the way different musics affect uh, your uh, style, your posture, your tension, your, um, uh, the activity of your muscles and so on. And so we were really um, exploring live to an audience. Um, and um, by the grace of God, we found some really interesting information, uh, which we didn't entirely expect. So for example, if you play a, a difficult contemporary piece that is there to test your technical abilities, um, and then you turn to, say, a piece of Bach, a relatively technically straightforward piece, I'm trying to avoid the word simple, um, the trace of the anxiety from the first piece will carry over to the second. Um, we were also looking at the way in which um, the physiological traces that you're recording from um, uh, a, an electrode stuck to your skin will show up unexpected characteristics of the music. So we discovered a, a wide range of responses to playing the bark, depending on the circumstances. And what really came out of this was the staggering variety of um, athleticism and musicality that come from context, that come from ordering pieces, that come from programming. 